Our Tuesday guest this week is the star of one of the best-loved and most innovative children's television shows of all time. Nightmare was made in Norwich by Anglia TV. It was a fantasy game show presided over by a dungeon master. It soon became clear, though, that the budget just wasn't big enough to build castles and caverns and battlefields in the studio. So the producers turned to digital technology. And in 1987, this was a great innovation, a form of virtual reality creating all the backdrops with computers. The viewers loved it, and at its peak, more than a thousand teams every year were applying to go on the show. There were more than a hundred episodes. Our Tuesday guest this week is Treyguard of Dunshelm, but we'll call him Hugo Myatt. Hugo, welcome. Thank you very much. Or should I say, welcome, watchers of illusion. <laughs> <laughs> or listeners of illusion. I yes, think. yes, the illusion is between the ears on, yeah, on, is, on this indeed. medium. Um, but uh, people still reminding you all the time about this. And in fact, you go to events and meet fans of the programme, don't you? It's astonishing. It is absolutely astonishing. People come up to me and say, you made my childhood. I feel terrible. I mean, can one be retrospectively responsible <laughs> for somebody? But no, that it had such an effect. We knew we were doing something different, but we didn't realise it would have such an effect. And a great many people I've come across who said it's what started them on in the gaming industry or computer industry or all or, or these fantastic things people do nowadays, you know, digital stuff. Uh, and this was 31 years ago, yeah. which was really breaking new ground, wasn't it? Was. It was. It was astonishing, yeah. And uh, but, I mean, are you su- I mean, are you surprised that people? Because it's been off the air for twenty odd years now. Thirty hasn't nearly. It? Yeah. Really. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, uh, it is astonishing. But I, I still get fan letters. Do you? <laughs> yes. So then the post office find you and, and send them yeah, on. Yeah, well, they, they usually go to the agent and then to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll talk a lot more about the genesis mm-hmm. of the programme and about how your career started, Hugo, as we go through. But we've also asked you to bring in six records and. Yeah. Are you a, a big man for listening to music? Do you listen to a lot? I think most of my uh, friends in relationship would probably say I'm more or less musically dead, but that's not absolutely true. Uh, it, it isn't as important to me as it is perhaps to most people, put it that way. But you've picked a six nonetheless. Yes, oh yes, I have my favourites of all sorts. Um, it's quite difficult finding six, in fact, where uh, there's so many. But um, I don't really seek out music. It catches me rather than my seeking it out. <laughs> Well, shall we hear the first selection and see how it catches the rest of us? Right. What's it going to be? Well, the first one is because when I was a child, I'll do this quickly, uh, I can remember about seven years old, I was um, playing outside the kitchen window. My mother always listened to those uh, BBC programmes of the day, light programme, the things like... Um, two-way family favourites and music while you work and everything. More or less, most of it washed over me until this one day and I heard this and it's the first time I ever had a frisson down my spine. And this is, of course, Edith Piaf doing Je ne regrette rien. The Little Sparrow, Edith Piaf, with No Regrets, Je ne regrette rien, uh, which uh, your fr- French pronunciation, Hugo, is much better than mine. I, I think. think it was, actually, but I'm very pleased to hear it. <laughs> Hugo Myatt, uh, the actor, is our guest this week, picking the records. Five more to come. And, Hugo, let me ask you about the, the genesis of Nightmare, the, the TV programme which was such a favourite for, for so many years and for so many children made people's childhood, as, as mm. you said, people tell you all the time. But well, how did it come about? Well, it's all down to the brilliance of Tim Child, who, who created it. Um, I didn't really know how it came to him, but uh, Tim was a great games player, uh, of any sort of games from whatever to chess, you know. Um, but I think he thought, when he watched uh, computer games, that it would be nice to be inside the game and not outside playing it. I think that was the sort of the idea behind it. Um, and then, of course, uh, because it's very difficult to explain Nightmare if nobody's seen it, um, we have a child who's virtually blindfolded with a helmet over his head and three others uh, guiding and um, uh, and trying to help him get through all these fantastic uh, scenarios. But, um, one thing that made it work, of course, is you've got the three advisors shouting at the poor dungeoneer, the one under the helmet, and back home, everybody's shouting at the, the three advisors. So... Um, You've got a lot of drama in it, which a lot of sort of game shows type things don't have. And you can't really call it a game show. It's more like an adventure quest. 
Does that make sense? I yes, because well, there was a bit of a craze, wasn't there, at about that time in the 80s for something called Dungeons and Dragons. Yes, yes. Um, and it was that made live on a TV screen, really, that's right. wasn't it? Yes but, yes, but it was quite tough. I mean, people say there weren't any winners. In fact, there were eight winners over eight years. Not one a season. It just happened to work out that way. So sometimes there were no winners at all in that particular season. Yes, it was, uh, it was tough. But the viewers didn't mind that there wasn't, per se, winners at the end of each programme, a resolution. No, and we got shot of the winners quite quickly because we wanted to get on with the next game, so people don't remember the winners at all. (laughs) (laughs) And there was you presiding over it all as the dungeon master. Um, How did you characterise when when you were trying to get this ready to go? It was quite difficult because at first there was just me. I mean, there were other actors in in, in, uh, what we called the void, in the blue void. It was blue screen in those days. Um, But my character had to provide some of the menace as well as being a bit uh, helpful, avuncular. So it was quite a difficult role to play. Later on, we got a super villain called um, Mark Knight who played Lord Fear. But uh, the first programmes, the first shows, um, I had to provide both, really. And sometimes um, the poor child who was going to go under the helmet, uh, when he came through that, they'd never seen us before, uh, came onto the set and walked through that doorway... Some of them were shaking. I felt terrible, you know. I was going, welcome, and all this stuff, and this poor <laughs> child is shaking. Like, But they very quickly got over that and into the game. I think children like a good fright, don't they? Particularly this time of the year with Halloween just I think gone. they don't mind being frightened as long as they know they're safe. Yes. Uh, it's like horror films or whatever, isn't it? Um, as long as you know you're safe, you can be as frightened as you like. It's quite, quite a joy to be frightened then. <laughs> and the programme was always made in Norwich, wasn't it? Oh, yes, it? yes, all of it. So was it, it was a creation of Anglia originally? Well, it was Tim Child's creation. He, he was a, a, a journalist uh, at Anglia uh, in the magazine programme, and a journalist and, and a, um, a director of uh, that. But he came up with this idea. But in fact, it was made independently, but through Anglia for the network. So uh, it, was, it wasn't an Anglia production as such. But all these fantastical places, that it all happened on Magdalen Street, I think. Didn't yes, it? down at um, what used to be Studio A, or whatever they called it, which is now something else, I think. I don't know. Must have been curious, creating all these amazing fantasy worlds, and then at the end of a day's work, walking out onto the street and walking up Magdalen Street. Yes. yes. <laughs> it's, uh... it, it was something. What people don't realise very often is that, um, although it was recorded, we actually did it as it were live. So there were no rehearsals. And no retakes. I mean, there were obviously camera rehearsals for us, but no rehearsals with the children and no retakes with the children. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been a competition. So it it was quite hair raising. You know, you didn't know what was going to happen. You thought you did, but the kids always came up with something else. So uh, we had some moments, as you can imagine. Well, maybe we'll talk about uh, talk about some of those moments as we go through. Uh, Nightmare, the, the, the TV show for children that Hugo Myers, our guest, starred in. But, Hugo, we'll pause for a second record, shall we? Right. Now, this, I can't really explain why. Uh, this is um, it comes out of various titles. It's uh, The Moon is Shining, Shining Moon, and there are others, I know. But it's uh, a Russian piece. It's a balalaika piece played by a balalaika orchestra, or that is to say about eight, I think, um, balalaikas. It's just so jolly, such fun, and so clever, and so fast. I just absolutely love it. Shining Moon and the balalaika orchestra. What a curious sound that is, but quite (laughs) mesmerising, I I, I think. uh, I mean, Hugo, it it brings me in mind of uh, Dr Zhivago all those years ago. Yes, I suppose so. Um, but it's it never quite that cheerful in Dr. Shivago. No, but it, it, there's one thing I like about it. Is it, it, it it's a different impression of Russia <laughs> from the one we usually get. <laughs> <laughs> but this, the instrument is a stringed instrument, clearly, yeah, yeah, isn't it? And yeah. um, it's got, I think, a curious shape. But yeah, it gives, it's a triangular it's, sort just of shape. takes you to Russia and yes, the steps, yes, doesn't it? Yes, that's right. Have you, have you been? No. No, I have no reason for this at all. I just happen to like it. Well, that's as good a reason as any. Uh, The actor Hugo Myatt is our guest this week. And uh, I'm just in the early part of the programme concentrating Mm. on Nightmare, the the Mm. extremely successful children's programme. And I think a lot of people will recall it for for the technology that you pioneered. There must have been teething problems, though, when you're dealing with something quite that new. Um, I'm sure there were. Uh, They shielded it from you, though. Well, no, it's not that. I mean, I was there for the very first pilot, which was a short pilot which wasn't going to be broadcast. I remember um, Tim Child um, taking me aside and saying I'll explain about the show to you and he explained it to me and I said, yes, I see. 
Right. Of course, Tim. I didn't understand a word he was talking about, but being an actor, you always say yes to everything, you know. Um, and it was only when we actually started doing the pilot, which he must have put a tremendous amount of work into before to know how it would come across at all, uh, that I began to understand what this show was about. So I was there right from the very beginning of um, that. The, For instance, the... Um, I don't know what you call them, the scenarios, the sets, the, the artwork was all done by a, a wonderful uh, chap called David Rowe. And uh, that gave the magic to the thing, I think, the, the, certainly the first series or two. Um, but how they came up, how they organised all that, I have absolutely no idea. I'm just a jobbing actor and was asked to do that role, you know. And p- particularly then, 31 years ago mm. now, it, it wasn't really on most people's horizon, I don't think, that computers could do quite that much and, and generate scenery. No, you... well, uh, practically everything before that, when they tried to do uh, chroma key, as it was called... Um, this is the had... blue screen that Yeah, is, the blue screen it? thing. Nobody had any shadows because they hadn't worked out how to make shadows, you see. And so people appeared to be floating in midair rather than actually grounded. And um, one of the things they did in Nightmare, very, very, well, right in the beginning, is they managed to actually get people standing on the ground, apparently, really. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, you must have been sort of aware of the, what the experimental nature of this. Did, oh, yeah. did that appeal to you? Yes, well, a lot of it appealed to me. Uh, absolutely, quite truthfully, it was all... Um, I don't know... Uh, for instance, I had an earpiece to the director, and sometimes I get really helpful things like, "Do something, Hugo," and you, you know, you're on camera, three camera. You can't rep- say what. <laughs> so you <laughs> had to invent a bit yeah, of business. Well, you just think, what? Where are we going with this? What? What? Uh, I mean, some of the, uh, the puzzles and uh, riddles and things that the kids had to answer were quite tricky, and I didn't always know the answer. And what I was really worried about is they say, do something, Hugo. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know what the answer to this one is. <laughs> <laughs> but had you done much of that sort of extemporising in the past? No, I hadn't really. I mean, I, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think the people who really were superb in this were all the actors who worked in the void, as we call it, the blue, the blue chroma key um, part of the studio. Um, they didn't actually have a script. They just had a, a, a scenario that this is where you've got to get the child to, or if the child fails, hard luck. Um, but it's very easy to go off on a tangent, you see, and very difficult to get back. So they were very good. And no, none of them, we had 31, I think, in all, different actors and actresses. Don't think any of them ever screwed it up, which is fantastic, isn't it's it? It's astonishing when you're yeah. working with, with... Well, you have to imagine. I talked about radio mm, being the art yeah. of imagination earlier, but with only a very plain backdrop and all the... Uh, the, the scenery being put in electronically, then uh, what, how does that test an actor? Well, I think even more so, realise you're talking to someone who can't see their face because you've got this all-encompassing helmet on. So they're actually acting against a blank person and I have no idea how that person is going to react. They can't tell from their facial expression or anything. So it, it, it's quite a tricky job, I reckon. I thought they were marvellous. I really did. And the children always got it. Uh, yeah, the, the children were quite astonishing. For the first few moments when they came into the studio, they, they you know, like anybody goes into a television studio, they, they sort of look up and they're, they're oh dear, this is fat. But that passed so quickly. Once they got into the game, they forgot all about it. They were right in there. And when the ratings took off and all the letters came in with people mm-hmm. wanting to come on the show, more than a thousand a year at oh, one yeah, point, yeah. Um, were, were you um, were you t- taken up to the ITV executives, um, <laughs> uh, you know, the, no. the, the, the special place where they have their drinks in no. the Anglia House? And... No, none of that. No, none of that. It didn't really make uh, much difference at all. The only thing I can say it did is uh, I, I've done thirty-eight pantos in my time, mostly playing the villain, and um, I found. After the nightmare, I was being paid a lot more to play the villain in Pantos than I had been before, though I was doing exactly the same job. <laughs> it's because you were getting to millions of people. Yeah, well, that was The it. magic of TV. Yeah, that was it. Which yeah. maybe has gone away a little bit a little now, because t- yeah. TV's a little bit more commonplace, isn't it? Yeah, it doesn't seem to work the way it did then, but uh, it was nice while it lasted. <laughs> right, record number three. Ah, now this. It is um, Buddy Holly and Peggy Sue. Why? I just think, at the time it came out, and we'd been listening to sort of, um, well, there was sort of a legacy from the war. There was an awful lot of still big band. There was a lot of um, sort of um, nostalgic, romantic songs, and, um, and uh, you know, the, the crooners, there's Bingham, there was Sinatra, and suddenly this thing happened. 
And this, just the opening to it is what I love. It just was such, at that time, to us, such a different sound. It just... Three more records, um, which we'll be playing in the next half an hour with Hugo Myatt, who uh, you'll remember, I'm sure, as the Dungeon Master from uh, the uh, Anglia TV series, the successful series Nightmare. But uh, going right back, Hugo, um, tell me about your life then. These days and for 40 years you've had a home in Norfolk, but I don't think you're from Norfolk originally, are you? No, I'm not. Why Norfolk? Well, it's silly, really, but uh, it was Arthur Ransom. I, I absolutely adored his books, and I was very lucky. I actually met him, and um, this inspired me to build boats. Now, I lived in Harrow, which is known as Harrow on the Hill, and I built two boats when I was young. Well, I was about 14, I think. I built the first one was a six-foot Pramdig, and the second one was a Norfolk Sharpie, which I thought came from Norfolk. In fact, it was Norfolk, Virginia, but I only discovered that later. Um, but anyway... So, because of the broad stories that he um, he wrote, and um, and my fascination with boats, incidentally, there's not much water around Harrow on the Hill. So, uh, I just got this fascination with Norfolk and the Broads, and wanted to come and live here, and eventually did. So, the boat, the the books were the Big Six and Coot yes, Club. Yes, Coot Club. Yeah. And he, he wrote, because he's very famous for the, the, the uh, books he wrote about the uh, Lake District. Yeah, yeah. But was, he did set them in other places. Yes, he did a lot on the broads and some around the Essex rivers as well. I can't remember what they're called now. Uh, there, was, uh, there was one where they went to sea when they shouldn't have done, yes, wasn't there? Didn't and secret mean to go water, to sea. <laughs> things secret, like that. Yes. You've, hit, you've hit on poem one of my loves <laughs> as well. I mean, and, and the thing with me was that it was the, the seductive language in the books, which was it was all the technical phrases about sailing, and I mm. had no idea about it. No, no, I. But the um, amazing thing about it is he always explains it. So. Uh, if he says the painter or something, you know what that is. A paragraph later, said uh, he took the the rope at the front of the the boat, the painter, and you, then you. He actually told you later on what it was. He never left you in the dark about these things. Quite quite interesting technique. And the sails were always the sheets, yes. weren't they? And there was something called a centerboard, which I ah, had yes. to work out what that was. It as was well. a drop keel, basically. We mustn't get into boats. <laughs> Arthur Ransom, though, you, you yes. said you met him. Yes, I did. How did yes. that come about? Uh, well, it came about really through a book signing. Um, my my mother discovered that uh, he was going to be on his these things, and um, I was agog in a rush, rushed off to see him and had quite a long chat with him. It was very nice. But, of course, he was Captain Flint. I hadn't realised that that was who he was. And it, like his sketches in the books, he was exactly like that. Big, round-headed, balding man with a big walrus moustache. Quite a big chap. Quite an interesting man. I mean, he was a spy in the First World War and things like that. Hadn't he been in Russia when it was yes. a revolution as well? He married Trotsky's secretary, I believe. Was he very kindly to a young man who was a bit starry-eyed? Well, I was very small and young. He was nice enough to me. <laughs> <laughs> he probably got used to it by then. But that then planted the seed for Norfolk. Yeah. And, and did, did you yeah. say, um, come on, Mum and Dad, I want to go on holiday to the, there and maybe go sailing or um, on the broads? Yes, I don't think they were terribly good. I think we got as far as uh, Beckles once. Um, my mother was terrified of water, and I took her out on, on the... Um, Waverly on a little um, motorboat, and when I jumped off it to pull it, <laughs> pull it into the side, she screamed. She thought I'd abandoned her <laughs> in the middle of the river. <laughs> so yes, now I don't think they were terribly interested. But uh, yeah, but as you say, Harrow isn't famous for its water. No, no. being up on a hill, <laughs> famous for a school. Though. Yeah, yeah. That's not where you went, though, was it, Hugo? I went to a. Um, it's curious. I went to a school called, was then called the Lower School of John Lyon Harrow, which is a day school. Um, Harrow School was founded by a chap called John Lyon, and it's founded for the poor people of Harrow, as all public schools were, you know. And over the years, of course, it came grander and grander and grander. And I think in the Victorian era, or somewhere around there, they decided to try again. So they decided to have a day school, and it's called the Lower School because it's lower down the hill. Not for any other reason. I think it's now just called the John Lyon School. I don't know. It's uh, 50 odd years since I've been there. <laughs> it was a good education, though, was it? It was a good education, but it didn't take. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure there are vestiges still there. I well, we, we're going to have to ask you uh, how you, you got onto the stage in the first place and where that ambition came, but we'll, we'll pause for some more music first. And after Buddy Holly, we're on to record number four and another B. Yes, this is Bach, Brandenburg Concerto Number 2 in F major. 
This is the third movement because, it, again, it's, it's so bright and jolly. And um, I was a choir boy, and the, the treble voice, you know, you think it's going to be there forever and then it breaks, you've lost it. But this uh, is a fanfare trumpet. And the fanfare trumpet, I think, is the nearest thing you can get to a treble voice singing. Bach's second Brandenburg Concerto in F major, the third movement, chosen for us today by Hugo Myatt, who's our guest. Hugo made it really as a, an actor into most people's consciousnesses as the dungeon master in Nightmare, which was an Anglia TV programme. But the acting bug presumably came a lot earlier than that. Can you remember when? Um, yes, I can. Uh, I, uh, I was a child of the... Uh, post-war era, which uh, a lot of our parents have been through the 30s, and, the, and so the thing is, you had to get a job, get a job. And I had um, two jobs. One was, uh, first one was in uh, shipping in the city. I wasn't very good at that, and uh, that was short-lived. And then I got a job in the National Coal Board, as a, in personnel, as it was called in those days, which I was even worse at. Um, I was terrible. I mean, I just hated it all. And I knew I wanted to, to live sort of in my imagination. I got these jobs because I was supposed to, you know, not because I wanted to. And uh, I always wanted to live in my imagination. And I heard a programme on the radio about children's theatre. And I thought, I could do that. I could get into theatre that way. I found one of these uh, children's theatre companies and um, conned them into thinking that I was a great actor. I think they probably conned me in retrospect. And uh, anyway, that's how I started in children's theatre. We used to charge kids two bob a head and took, uh, you know, drove around in a converted ambulance with a few costumes and props and did two to four shows a day. Uh-huh. That's how it started. Mostly schools, I think, but there were other venues we went to and um, somebody would take the money. Two bob a head <laughs> in those days, I think it was. Are we talking about, what, early 60s, that sort of yes, time? Yes, it would, well, mid 60s, I think, when I started, yeah. Yeah. Had you acted at school, though? No, I hadn't done anything anyway. So you'd always been at the back of the queue when they were yeah. asking for volunteers? Yeah, you? I wasn't uh, keen then at all. Well, it wasn't... I don't know why it was. But then I did it and I loved it, so I carried on doing it for the next 50 years. <laughs> now, the, the great instrument that you have, Hugo, if I may say, as an actor, is, is the voice, isn't yes, it? Yes, that catches me out sometimes. Um, if people don't recognise me, uh, well, they shouldn't now, I'm, I'm not so much older, but they do recognise the voice. And they suddenly go, oh, it, it's you, isn't it? <laughs> How you answer that, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but, but as a young man, did that in- encourage you that you had the sort of voice that would carry, that, that would resonate? No, no, I don't think so. I didn't, wasn't particularly aware of it. I mean, people come to you and say, uh, oh, you must have done lots of Shakespeare and things. Well, I've hardly done any Shakespeare. It, it wasn't something that uh, appealed to me particularly. Uh, people say, well, what, what sort of acting do you like? And I said, this I shouldn't have ever have said it, but I said, well, I like to stand around with a glass in my hand saying witty things, you know. Noel Coward. <laughs> yeah, <that's... laughs> Have you ever been in a Noel, Noel oh, Coward? Oh, yes, I've done Coward. <laughs> I've done a hundred and... I've worked out the other day, 174 or 78 plays. I can't remember now. That's a lot of plays. And I've directed, it, I think, I worked it out. I thought because I was coming out, I'd better find out about these things. I re- realised I've directed 64 in my time. So that's quite a lot of roles, you know, to have played. Is directing something that you really wanted to do? And, oh. It came about because somebody just asked me to direct an, an, a play for them, and uh, I did, and I discovered that, uh, to my surprise, the actors quite liked me, my directing them. I think I'm what they call an actor's director. That is to say, I know, I know how they feel about things. People always think you've got to break them down and build them up and shout at them and things. It doesn't do any good at all, I don't think. They're, they're people, and there are things that embarrass them. Individual things, you know. Some actors don't like this. Some actors don't like that. It doesn't mean you try and stretch their their uh, talents. You do. You try and get them to do things they wouldn't have done otherwise. But, In a constructive fashion. Yeah, but don't embarrass them. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. Just about anything is better than yeah. that, isn't it? But going back to the, those days in the uh, mid sixties and, and on the van and, and going yeah. to places and, and performing to children who are a pretty tough audience. Yes. Do, do you think that that sped up your development as an actor? Well, I, I, I did a lot of rep, you see, this is the point, and I love rep. Um, Not much of it now, is no, it? No, no, I mean, we kept it going for ages. I mean, I did a lot of weekly rep, two weekly, three weekly, four weekly, all that stuff. And you get to play a huge number of parts, completely different parts, many of them which you're not suited to at all. 
But because that's the way the company works, you know, one day you're playing the lead, the next day you're playing the sermon or whatever. And I think that's the best way of learning to be an actor. Um, I've also played <laughs> Cromer. Um, End of the pier. Well, yes, it's quite an interesting story. I, I played Sabrina Fair there, which is a, a, a romance, really. And uh, one particular night, the, there was a storm. Water was com coming through the floorboards, and the audience were holding their feet up. You know, and the manager kept running around saying, "Louder, louder!" It's very difficult to say, "I love you," you know, <laughs> louder. Anyway, but in the middle of this, the maroons went off, and this is where the lifeboat was on the end of the pier. The maroons went off. Everybody knew what that meant, and the whole audience, to a man, just left. And there we were, acting away. And they'd all gone. <laughs> they'd all gone to watch the lifeboat down the slip. <laughs> oh dear. Well, you can't compete with the no, RNLI no. always, can no. you? That's the, that's the thing. Because you're so close and you're working together, and, and in weekly rep, for instance, you have to learn a play a week whilst you're playing another one and rehearse a play a week. So you're, you, if it's a three-act play, you will learn an act tonight for the next day and you have to be word perfect the next day. You obviously, I mean, some actors do have difficulties, but you clearly never did have problems with remembering lines. Not till I got older. Uh, it doesn't get any easier, that's the problem. And then it does become, um, I mean, I, can't, I couldn't do that now. Well, we'll come right up to date in a moment, mm -hmm. Hugo. Uh, but first, the penultimate record. So, so where are we going to go with this last but one? It's the three tenors of Solo Mio, 1994. I'm amazed it was that long ago. They're just having such fun. And I... Domingo, Pavarotti and Carreras, the three tenors who conquered the world back in 1994. And that was Osolomio, the fifth record choice of Hugo Myatt. And we're just stunned by the quality of those three voices melded in there. Yes, I mean, they're brilliant, but they just were having such fun. Now, what, what are you up to these days then, Hugo? Because I hear actors never quite retire. No, I think, well... Actors don't actively retire. That is to say, we don't make a decision. The, the business tends to retire you. <laughs> the phone doesn't ring as often. And people have often said to me, oh, well, what have you done apart from Nightmare? And that's when I say I've done 175 what it is plays. <laughs> you know? So I'm, I, I, I don't do theatre much now. Oh, well, I don't do it at all really now um, because you do get tired of living out of a suitcase and nobody builds a theatre at the end of your road, you know, um, which is a shame, very nice... Um, so I, I had quite a long uh, career in voiceovers, uh, but nowadays I, I just seem to um, do conventions, which, uh, amazingly, I go there as Tregard from Nightmare, and people just flock to them. It's wonderful. And the whole explosion of fantasy and science yeah. fiction, which is all in together, yeah. isn't it? Um, yeah. And the comic books. Yeah. This all this all comes together, and, and it's extraordinary now. It's probably ten, a hundred times more popular than it was yeah. when you started well, in 87. That's, that's probably true, yeah. I mean, it's amazing. These uh, these conventions are astonishing, and uh, a lot of the, uh, the people who come to them dress up as their favourite characters, uh, of whatever it is, you know, Star Trek or whatever. Do they dress up as you? I've not actually seen anyone dress up as me. I... I was caught out with um, Sylvester McCoy, who uh, was um, at one of these conventions uh, as Doctor Who. You know, he'd been uh, Doctor Who, and we were chatting in the, uh, in the hotel the night before the convention at nice time. And then at the convention, this character comes up to me, and I, I, I said, oh, hello, Sylvester. And I started talking to him, and it took me ages to realise it wasn't him at all. It was someone who... <laughs> dressed up but so perfectly and looked so like him I actually convinced it was him I just didn't realise it <laughs> looked more like Sylvester McCoy than Sylvester yeah, McCoy uh, that's right astonishing <laughs> and, and some of the fans are, are too young to remember it first time yes. so presumably it's on video or DVD is it these days um, no it's not on DVD it was uh, it's been repeated once on the uh, something called the Sci-Fi Channel which I think no longer exists and then it's been repeated on Challenge Television uh, but also I think you can see the whole lot in rather poorer quality on YouTube or something like that. So that's how they see it. Uh, yes, we've had um, we had one little child turn up in the whole Dungeoneer's costume with the, with the helmet he'd made himself. It was beautiful. And he was only well, 10 years old or something like that. So must... Uh, I don't know. They, they just somehow seem to see it. So we've got two or three generations that um, are keen on watching it.
Well, Norwich and Norfolk played such a major part in your yeah. acting career, but and I know that you've got a home in in Norfolk as well. So, uh, when when you're not uh, when you're resting, say, and, and you're in <laughs> Norfolk, what is it about the county then? Is is it the broads still that captivates? I just, I, 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 yes, the broads do captivate, but it's something. There's a lot of community, real community in Norfolk, uh, in in the villages and um, uh, places where, if you go to London, they talk about communities. There's no such thing as any communities in London. You, you probably don't know your neighbour. I mean, I I remember years ago living in a, a flat in in Holland Park, and I didn't know who lived across the corridor, let alone anything else. Um, but you don't get that in Norfolk. You get they're very friendly people. I think Norfolk. Which reminds me of a, a quick funny story. We took the play The Caretaker to uh, Hunston or Hunstanton to those of you who don't speak Norfolk. And when we got there, they they put up right across a banner across the theatre saying Tammy Jones, you know the the great country singer, Sunday night concert. But they just had a huge banner of Tammy Jones. So uh, we played. From Monday to Friday, the, the Caretaker, which is a fairly bleak play. It's a pinter. Yes, pinter. Uh, to to uh, sparse audiences, to say the least. And then come Saturday night, the place was absolutely packed. As the curtain opened, I was on stage with this uh, very bleak set. And sitting in front of me were rows and rows of people in cowboy hats and rhinestones. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, we soldiered on to this sort of... You could tell it sort of stunned silence. <laughs> and uh, apparently at the interval, I don't know, because I wasn't there, their sort of representative went out and said, you know, when's Tammy Jones coming on? To have explained to them they got the wrong day and this is a play. And this is a... <laughs> they came back. They came back for the second half. Well, you'd persuaded them <laughs> in, hadn't you? <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't know where that came from. I just remembered it um, yeah, that's a fabulous story. That <laughs> and, and takes us to Hun Stanton yeah. beautifully as well. Yeah. Uh, Hugo, time for one more record. Ah, yes. Well, this is down to my mother, really. Um, my mother was a tremendous pianist, not professional, but she was just uh, a lovely pianist. She played all sorts of um, stuff, from light classical to uh, popular songs of her day. And in fact, she was so popular when uh, in the summer, when the windows were open, she'd be playing away. All the neighbours used to come out with clippers for their hedges or, or lawnmowers, really, just to listen to her play. But what she was tremendous at was boogie and ragtime, and this was one of her favourites. It's "Bumble Boogie" by uh, Jack Finner, and played this time by Jules Holland. So this would just remind me of my mother. Doing a bit yeah. on the piano. Uh, Hugo might thank you very much. Or, or Treyguard, how would Treyguard sign off today? Uh, oh, well, it's a temporal disruption approaching. Uh, temporal disruption complete. Hugo, thank you. Thank you.